Okay, in this video, we're going to cover 3.4, which is a continuation of polynomial functions. I have no idea why it did this like escalating thing. So like this picture is here and then a picture of it is right there. And then a picture of that is right in there. It's just like, <laughs> like when you have a mirror in a mirror. Um, I don't know why I did that, but I will remove that <laughs> before next semester because that is I don't know what I did to make that happen, but it happened. Um, but in this section, we're gonna start off with what's called the fundamental theorem of algebra, okay? In the complex number system, which is imaginaries, okay? Every nth degree polynomial has exactly n number of zeros, okay? However, some of them may not be x-intercepts because some of them may be imaginary, okay? That's all that that's saying. So, um, if you have a degree with n, uh, it's going to have that many number of zeros. Now, whether they're real or imaginary, we won't know, OK? Um, we just know that they exist and that they're there, OK? Um, so oh, once you know what all those zeros are, you should be able to factor your polynomial into x minus the first zero, x minus the second zero, all the way until you get x minus the last zero, okay? And of course, your leading coefficient would be in the front, okay? Now, um, the problem is in the previous sections, they were telling us what the zeros were and we were able to go from there. But in this section, they're really gonna discuss, well, what happens when you're not given any zeros, when you're not given a starting point? And they just give you this big polynomial and they tell you, go for it, graph it, right? Uh, find all the zeros and graph it. And you're just like, well, where do I start, okay? Um, that's what we're gonna be talking about in this section. So of course, we're gonna lean ourselves into it. We're not just gonna go straight um, to the difficult thing, okay? We're gonna go little by little with each little bit of information. So it says the first degree polynomial x minus two, remember the highest exponent is one, so it has exactly one zero. And how do you find it? You set the function equal to zero and you find that zero, right? Whereas um, this one is the second degree polynomial. So you have two zeros. It just happens that when you factor it, each one of those equal to zero give you the same number. So it does have exactly two zeros, it has a repeated zero, okay? So it's the same number twice. I think in a previous section, we wrote it down like this, squared. And so you knew that the zero was three, but it had multiplicity of two. So that's how many times that zero repeated, okay? Here we have a third degree polynomial and if I factor out the x and I were to factor this, um, you would get these two factors. If you don't know how to factor this, um, you can use the quadratic formula. Remember, x squared plus 4 means that a equals 1, b is x and it's missing, and then c is the constant and that equals 4. So if I do negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4 times a times c, all over two times a. I will get zero plus or minus um, negative 16 over two. Well, I don't need the zero. I just get plus or minus the square root of 16 i, which is four i, and then that's plus or minus two i. And so then all they did was do x minus the positive two i, and then x minus a negative two i which is where the plus came from, okay? And so it is addressing both of those two solutions. So this means x equals 2i and x equals negative 2i, okay? Um, and so this one has three zeros, as it should, right? The exponent was three at the very beginning. So it should have three zeros. If you set this factor equal to zero, you get zero. If you set this factor equal to zero, you get the positive 2i. And if you set this factor equal to zero, you get the negative 2i. Okay, 
Now, what happens if they don't tell us anything about the zeros? But we need to know at least one of them to like start the problem, okay? Um, that's why we have this test called the rational zeros test, okay? The rational zeros test basically tells you the possible rational zeros of a polynomial, okay? Um, and so the way it works is you take the factors of this last guy and you take the factors of your leading coefficient, okay? If you take the factors of the leading term and the ending term, um, and you take all the ratio combinations and sign combinations of those factors, um, you do end up with the whole list of rational zeros, okay? So they try to explain that in words, but it really does help if you see it worked out, okay? So, this is how I like to word it. Um, I say the possible rational zeros equals the factors of the constant term over the factors of the leading coefficient, okay? Um, and so then that's what we're gonna do from there. So if I had this problem here, they just tell me the possible rational zeros are this. Well, where the heck did you get all that from, right? It's important, okay? So I know that the possible rational zeros are the factors of um, the constant, which is um, six, and it doesn't matter the sign. We could put negative six, but it really doesn't matter. And the factors of the coefficient here, which is one, okay? Um, the reason why it doesn't matter is because one times negative six is the same as uh, a positive one times a negative six is negative six, and a negative one times a positive six is also negative six, okay? So that's why we have all the double sign. But other pair that makes six is two and um, three. And again, those could be positive or negative as well, okay? Now for the factors of one, there's only there's no factors, it's just one, positive or negative one. Negative one times negative one is positive one, and positive one times positive one is positive one. So you could have either sign. Now, how does that work? I'm going to literally take this number over this number with any sign combination, this number over this number with any sign combination, this number over this number with any sign combination, and this number over this number with any sign combination. I notice I get the exact same list that they do, okay? Um, I hope they give us another problem so we can actually, um, they probably will, but let's keep going. So it says, find the rational zeros of this function and they give it to me. Now this is the list of possible rational zeros, okay? Now I'm going to use, I don't know what they're doing. Oh no, oh no, 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 no. They start applying synthetic division to all of those possibilities. And they say, only the ones that give you a zero remainder are gonna be your actual zeros, okay? So see how when they use negative one here, they got zero remainder, which meant that X equal to negative one was a zero, okay? They did it for positive two as well. And then they factored the leftovers, okay? Now, how on earth are you gonna know and this list is a short list, believe it or not. They can't get a whole lot longer. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight numbers that you're gonna have to try to see which ones work, okay? That is a nightmare when you're trying to do synthetic division 10 million times, okay? Or even just eight times. So I like to use my factor theorem, mostly because I'm heavily relying on my calculator to do all the computations for me, which is nice, right? I don't have to do any work other than know to use how, how to use my calculator. So I'm gonna use the factor theorem. The factor theorem tells me that if I plug in this number and I get zero, then this guy is a, is a zero, okay? And so instead of trying to do synthetic division with all of these numbers, instead, I'd rather use the calculator to plug them all into the function 
and see which ones are actual zeros. Okay, so I'm going to program my calculator. Let's start with the first x value, one. One stores x. Then I'm gonna enter the whole function. x to the fourth minus x to the third plus x squared minus three x minus six. And so once I have it in there, I'm gonna hit enter and it's gonna plug in. And I got negative eight. That means that one is not a zero. Now I'm gonna do negative one stores x and I'm gonna go back up to the top and hit enter to plug it in and I get zero. So that is nice. That tells me that this guy is gonna be a zero. That's important, okay? Now let's try two. I also get zero, which means this one is also a zero. Now I'll tell you how my strategy, okay? I know how to factor quadratics. And if I don't know how to factors, I can still find the zeros by using the quadratic formula, okay? But sometimes this list has like 20 different things in it. And you don't wanna sit there and do all 20 if you don't have to, right? It's all about time con uh, consumption. You wanna spend the least amount of time on it, especially when it's a test, okay? So the strategy is, if I know that I can factor or use the quadratic formula for a quadratic, okay, then that means I only need to shrink this function down to a quadratic, okay? Currently, it's an x to the fourth problem. If I want to dumb it down to a quadratic, quadratics have the highest exponent of two, okay? So if I've got the highest exponent of four, I need to bump it down two levels so that I can get the highest exponent of a square. So if I'm gonna bump it down two levels, that means that I need to find two zeros first before I'll be able to get to a quadratic, okay? And since I've already found two zeros, right? There may be more, but if I don't need to do all of this computation anymore, I could just, run with what I have. I know now that negative one and two are zeros, okay? So I don't need to carry on anymore with this because that is enough to get down to a quadratic, okay? So what do they do? They take the first one that I found, negative one, and they put all the coefficients of the function, okay? And then they did the synthetic division. So bring that one down, multiply, combine, multiply, combine, multiply, combine, multiply, and combine. And then with this result, I usually don't write another box. I usually just go straight from here and put the two out and then start going. But anyway, they rewrote it down here. You bring down your two, you multiply, you combine, you multiply, you combine you multiply, you combine. Then, okay, so you're gonna change this to a constant, no x's, but an x squared. So then your result becomes um, x minus the negative one, x minus the two, and then your quotient. So one x squared, um, no x's, cause it says zero x's, and then your plus three constant. And if you clean up the double negative, that's where they get positive one, x plus one, x minus two, and then x squared plus three. And if I could factor this, I would factor this some more, okay? Um, it can be factored using the quadratic formula, but when you do the quadratic formula, you'll realize that this has got imaginary answers in it, okay? So that's why down here, it says that this factor produces no real zeros. You get imaginary zeros from that one, okay? Um, but that means that these two are the only real zeros, okay? And if you're not sure about that, remember A is one, B is zero, and C is three. So if you were trying to set that factor equal to zero, you would have to use the quadratic formula. So negative B plus or minus 
b squared minus four times a times c all over two times a. So that's just zero. I get negative 12 over two. Oh, I don't even need the zero. This is just zero. So I get plus or minus the square root of 12 i, which is plus or minus two square root of three with an i, which equals plus or minus square root of three with an i, okay? So notice they're imaginary, okay? And those are not real. Which means not an x-intercept. Okay, but these guys are real, and so those are my x intercepts. And we know from the original function that it was an x to the fourth and a positive, so it should be going up on both ends. So it goes up on both ends, and you got this one and this one. And since the exponents are one and one, you know that it's going to cross through and cross through. And so notice that it crosses through this one and it crosses through that one. So this is very much what I do. I had to make sure that I added this in here, okay? I don't wanna be doing synthetic division for every single possible zero. So the first thing I do is find the list of possible zeros, and then I plug in each of those numbers into K to figure out which ones are actual zeros, okay? The ones that give me zero are the official zeros, okay? And then X minus those numbers are the factors. And then I can use those in the synthetic division as many times as I need to to um, eventually get down to a quadratic so that I could either factor it or use the quadratic formula, okay? So, and then the last step says, use synth the synthetic division can be used to test the possible rational zeros. Finding the first is often the most difficult part, but after that, the search is simplified by working with the lower degree polynomial obtained in the synthetic division, just like they did in example three. So they took out one zero and then what was left over, they took out the other zero and then what was left over was a um, quadratic. So we also know about complex numbers, imaginaries, right? They come in pairs. If you have plus i, you're also gonna have minus i mostly because the imaginary numbers come from the quadratic formula. And that quadratic formula has a plus or minus in front of the radical. So if you have a negative number inside of the radical, it makes it imaginary, but then now you have a plus and minus in front of that imaginary. So always guaranteed you're going to have two um, complex zeros and they're going to be specifically conjugates of one another, okay? So essentially the same numbers, but with one with a plus and one with a minus in between, okay? So because we know that they're always going to come in pairs, if somebody tells you that one complex number is a zero, then you automatically know that its conjugate is also a zero, okay? So it's really like they're giving you two clues instead of just one, okay? Um, so for instance, it says the result applies to the function x squared plus one, but not to the function x minus i. So remember, the conjugate pairs only applies to polynomials that have real coefficients, okay? And every polynomial that we're going to be given is going to have real coefficients, okay? Um, so here it says in example three, it says find a fourth degree polynomial function with real coefficients that has zeros negative one, negative one again, and 3i. Now, because 3i is a zero and the polynomial stated to have real coefficients, you automatically know that the conjugate of 3i, which is negative 3i, is also a zero, okay? So really you have four zeros that were given. Negative one was given twice, then you have positive 3i and negative 3i. So if you follow the linear factorization theorem, it should be x minus this number, but x minus a negative is where the plus comes from. And the same thing happens here. x minus a negative one is x plus one. Here you get x minus 3i, 
And here you get x minus the negative 3i, which the double negatives turn to plus, okay? Now, it says to find a fourth degree, okay? Any fourth degree. So essentially what that means is you could plug in any coefficient you want to, okay? And normally when it doesn't tell you what coefficient to use um, or give you a clue on what coefficient to use, you always just use one, okay? And so when you're trying to multiply this out, because they asked you for a polynomial with real coefficients, and right now I don't have everything real, what you want to do is you want to multiply these two together and multiply your imaginaries together. Now, when you multiply these together, you get x squared plus x plus x plus 1, which is x squared plus 2x plus 1. When you multiply these out, you get x squared plus 3xi minus 3xi minus 9i squared. These cancel. And then remember the i squared turns that to a positive 9. And so that's why you end up with x squared plus 9. But you still got to multiply those two things together. So here they did it. I don't know. Let's see. x times that. x to the fourth. That's 9x squared. Oops, now the next one, um, 2x cubed, 18x plus 1x squared, and then plus 9. And so we get x to the fourth, which is here, 2x cubed, which is there, x squared plus 1x squared is 10x squared, the 18x, and the 9. And so that's where that result comes from. And this is a polynomial with degree 4. Okay, so um, this is just letting us know that with this linear factorization theorem, some of these numbers could be complex, okay? Um, and this one is saying that if you don't want complex factors in there, you can just multiply the complex factors out and get a quadratic factor instead of a linear factor, okay? Um, but normally we want it all factored out. So it says every polynomial of degree n with real coefficients can be written as the product of a linear and quadratic factors with real coefficients where the quadratics have no real zeros. So that's great. Um, so it says a factor, a quadratic factor with no real zeros is said to be prime or irreducible over the reals. But, sure, but be sure you can see that this is not the same as being irreducible over the rationals, okay? So for example, this quadratic does not factor. Um, and if I were to factor it using imaginaries, it could factor into this, okay? Um, however, when you have something like this, this is a minus sign. And a minus signs can be factored using the difference uh, squares formula. You just have to take the square root of this number. And so you get square root of 2, square root of 2, one with the minus, one with the plus. And it is factorable over the reals. It's just not factorable over the rationals. Rationals meaning like just whole numbers and fractions, okay? No radicals that don't simplify because when you type those in the calculator, you just get these weird decimals, okay? So let's see what example four says. It says, find all the zeros of this function given that one plus three i is a zero. Okay, now we already know that if one plus three i is a zero, then it's conjugate one minus three i is also a zero. Now, I don't know how they're going to do this problem, Oh, they're gonna use long division. I don't like long division. So I'm gonna show you how to do this problem differently than the way that they suggested. So what they suggest is you're gonna have one minus the zero they gave you, and or x minus the zero they gave you, x minus the conjugate. So the hidden zero that they didn't quite give you, but pretty much they gave you, because you know they come in pairs, okay? And if you were to foil this out, you would get this. So that's already some work, okay? Then you would have to do long division to factor that out 
and then hope you could factor your quotient so that you could factor everything completely, okay? However, I am not going to do it that way. I'm going to do it a different way. And it's gonna look real ugly the first go round, but by the second go round, it cleans itself up, okay? So let's see this polynomial that they gave us. And I'm going to do it a little bit different. So the polynomial they gave us was um, f of x equal to x fourth minus 3x cubed plus 6x squared plus 2x minus 60. And they told me that 1 plus 3i was a 0. OK, if it's a 0, then when I do synthetic division, I should get 0 at the end. If it's 0, right, that should be true. So let's go ahead and go through this. And it's not going to be fun. It's going to be pretty difficult the first time. And then the second time you do it, it's not so bad. So I'm going to put my coefficients. And then I'm going to bring down the first number. And then I'm going to do 1 times 1 plus 3i. Well, if I distribute that 1, I just get 1 plus 3i. But when I add these, I get negative 2 plus 3i, because these are not like terms. So I could only combine the like terms, and the imaginary part just came down. Then I have to do negative 2 plus 3i times 1 plus 3i. And that's not easy, but I'm going to have to do it. So I get negative 2, negative 6i plus 3i plus 9i squared. So I get negative 2. When I combine these, I get negative 3i. And this is going to change that to a minus 9. So when I combine those, I get negative 11 minus 3i. So that's going to go here. Again, I can combine my reals. I just can't combine the imaginary. Excuse me. So then I get this. And then now I've got to take that and multiply it by the 1 plus 3i. So bear with me. That's going to give me minus 9i squared. If I combine those, I get negative 18i. And then this i squared will change that to a plus 9. So then I get positive 4 minus 18i. And again, this is a positive 4, so I can combine my reals but I still have that imaginary thing there. So I think I need a little tiny bit more room here, but now I have to do six minus 18i times one plus three i. So six times one is six, that's 18i. This is minus 18i, and this is minus 18 times three. Uh, minus 54i squared. Now these are going to cancel and this i squared is going to turn that to positive. And so I get 60 as the result here, which is what I needed. I needed that positive 60 because I knew I was supposed to get zero here. Okay. Now that was the hard part. Okay. This next part is a lot nicer. So remember, you can use these leftovers to shrink the function some more. And I should get zero again, because according to that conjugates theorem, if this is a zero, then the conjugate one minus three i is also a zero. And if it's a zero, I had better be getting the remainder of zero, right? That's the whole point. That's the whole definition of it. So I'm gonna do this whole process again, but this time it's not gonna be as awful, okay? so. Oh, can I do that? I'm just bringing down the one, just the one. And then the one gets multiplied by this. So it's one times one and one times minus three i. So that's one minus three i. Now, guess what? When I combine my real parts, I get negative one. When I combine my imaginary parts, they go away. Now, when I take this times negative one, I'm going to distribute the negative one. 
So negative one times one is negative one. Negative one times negative three i is positive three i. When I combine the real parts, I get negative six. When I combine the imaginary parts, they go away. Finally, let's do this times negative six. So negative six times one is negative six. Negative six times negative three i is positive 18 i. If I combine these, they go away. If I combine the imaginaries, they go away, which is why I do in fact get the remainder of zero, okay? Once it's down to three terms, that is enough for you to either factor it or use the quadratic formula. If you do use the quadratic formula, this is your A, this is your B, and this is your C. So you get X equal to negative B plus or minus B squared minus four times A times C, all over two times A. So I get one plus or minus 24 plus one, which is 25. So then I get one plus or minus five over two. So I get one plus five over two, which is six over two, which is three. And then I get one minus five over two, which is negative four over two, which is negative two. So what does that tell me? That tells me that my zeros are one plus three i, one minus three i, three, and negative two, which also tells me my factors are going to be x minus one plus three i, x minus one minus three i, x minus three, and x minus negative two. And you can clean that up. I'm gonna distribute. I'm gonna distribute. That's gonna be the same. And I'm gonna multiply the double negatives to get a plus, okay? And so that is the factors of it. Now, what did they want me to do? All it said was find all the zeros. So I didn't even need to write it in its factored form. I just needed to know what the zeros were, and that was it. Sometimes, though, they will say find all the zeros and then write the function as a linear, in its linear factorization. And this is linear factorization. Okay. Okay. So let's go see what they got as their final answer, just so we can compare, right? Um, here it is. So it says, at the end of all of their mess, they said you can conclude that the zeros are one plus three i, one minus three i, three, and negative two. And that's exactly what we got. One plus three i, one minus three i, three, and negative two. So we did get the same exact answer as they did. I just didn't have to do long division, okay? I don't particularly like long division, although if you're great at it, you can do that it is an option, okay? Um, and it says, in example four, if you were told that one plus three i is a zero of f, you could still find all the zeros of the function by using synthetic division to find the real zeros. Oh, see, now they're gonna talk about synthetic division, um, but they don't do it, okay. So they told me <laughs> I could have done it to third division, but they didn't do it, okay? And then again, if you use the quadratic formula, you'll get the other two zeros like I did. So this is just confirmation that the way I did it is just another way that you could do it. Um, now, I don't really use Descartes' rules of signs. I mean, you can use Descartes' rules of signs. I just don't, um, only because I use my calculator to plug in all the possible zeros, and then that makes shrinks my list down, like drastically. And I already know that I only need to find however many I need to get a quadratic. So if I have an x to the fifth polynomial, I need to find three of them, and then I will get to a quadratic. If I have an x cubed, I only need to find one and I'll get to a quadratic. If I have x to the fourth, I need to find two and I'll get x, I'll get down to a quadratic. So personally me, I do not use the Descartes rules of signs. 
although I am required to tell you about it, but um, we're probably not going to use it. Um, so let me just check off the box that I've said it, <laughs> and then we'll move on and carry on as if we don't use Descartes' rule of science. It's interesting. I mean, it does help if you're like completely in the dark. Um, so first you have to have your polynomial. And then all you do is you look at this polynomial and you see when you count the number of times that the coefficients go from positive to negative or vice versa. So every time there's a change in the sign, you count that, okay? Then you also count the number, then you change, this is the weird part. It says find f of negative x. To me, when I'm finding f of negative x, that means change all the signs of the odd exponents because the even exponents, when you square them, they still stay the same sign, okay? Um, but the negative exponents will change signs, okay? And then once you change all the negative, the odd exponent signs, you count your sign variations again. Um, and then the way it works is that you could have that many number of zeros or decrease it by two each go round um, because of the complex zeros. So, here we go. This is an example. So it says, um, so if you have this polynomial here, notice that it goes from positive to negative once and then from negative to positive twice. So it has two variations of sign, okay? Because it has two variations of sign, it's either gonna have two or no positive real zeros, okay? Then also what you're going to do is you're going to do the, um, the change. You're going to do the negatives. So notice that this guy has an odd exponent and this guy has an odd exponent. So when I do f of negative x, this guy is going to change to an x cubed. This guy is going to change to a positive 3x. And the plus 2 is like x to the 0. 0 is even. So this one does not change signs at all. Okay. And then now notice you only have one sign change, okay? Which means you can only have one negative real zero. So what are the possibilities? So here we have real zeros. Here we have negative zeros. And here we have um, imaginary zeros. So here's the possible combinations. I could have two reals uh, or zero reals, okay? Now, if I have two positive real, okay, so positive real zeros, negative real zeros or imaginaries, okay? This is a degree three, so I can only have three total. I will not have any imaginaries because imaginaries come in pairs, okay? So I only need one more, which means the other one has to be negative. However, if there were zero reals, both of those could possibly be, two of them could be imaginary and then one be negative, okay? Um, and I don't think there's any other way that this can go because the real numbers already tells us it's gonna be two or zero, okay? Um, and it just so happens that if you actually found the zeros, you would realize that you had two positive zeros and then one negative zero. So you actually had this situation right here, okay? With no complex zeros. Again, I don't use this all too much, but it is kind of helpful. So notice that here you have, um, uh, let's see, you have one sign change, two sign changes, or three sign changes. So for your positives, your positives and negatives, and then imaginaries. You got one, two, three changes. So you're either gonna have three or one, okay? Now, I don't know if they do it on the other page, but yes, they do. So if you're doing F of negative X, remember you're only changing the signs of the guys with the negative X, with the odd exponents. So only these two are gonna change signs. So notice it becomes negative three X cubed, that guy stayed negative, this one turns to negative X and that guy stayed negative. And then now you have zero sign changes. So you have zero negatives. 
So I know I'm not gonna have any negatives whatsoever. So if the highest exponent is three, then they're either all positive with no imaginaries, or I have one positive with two imaginaries. Okay. Um, and depending on how it factors, I don't know which one it is. Um, so it just depends. You'd have to like go do the rational zeros theorem, try them all out, see if one of them works, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, they drew it there just to show that it does actually have one real zero and the other two are imaginary. Now, again, that's a lot of talk about the Descartes rules. I don't use it all too much, but you can if you really wanted to. So here's example six. It's using the polynomial as a model. It says you are designing candle making kits. Each kit contains 25 cubic inches of candle wax and a mold for making a pyramid shaped candle. You want the height of the candle to be two inches less than the length of each candle of the squ candle square base. What should the dimensions of your candle be? Okay, it says the volume of a pyramid because it did say that you have a pyramid shaped candle. The volume is going to be found by one third times the base times the height, where B is the area of the base and H is the height, okay? Now, because it has a square base, so the area of the square base is going to be X squared. So you've got this, I'm gonna try to draw, I'm trying. Okay, so you've got this link, this link, and then you have some kind of height that goes down the middle from the tip top to the center, okay? Um, this measurement here from the top to the center is your height. Now it did tell us that the height is gonna be two inches less than the length, okay? So that means X minus two. So if I wanted to write that and plug everybody in, um, b is equal to x squared and h is equal to x minus 2, then the volume can be written like this. So they filled everybody in just like that. I didn't put parentheses around x squared, that's fine. And they said that each kit contains 25 cubic inches. So I already know the volume is 25. Now, if I multiply each side by this common denominator, when I multiply by three on this side, it'll just cancel. And when I multiply by three on this side, I get 75. And then they went ahead and they distributed the X squared. And so they got X cubed minus two X squared, and then they minus the 75 over. And then in order for me to find the solutions to this. This is the same thing as finding zeros, okay? They didn't give me anywhere to start with. So guess what? I have to do the possible rational zeros theorem. So that's all the factors of 75 over all the factors of one, which means all these guys over one, but if you put them all over one, it's gonna be the same numbers, right? And so then how do we know which one works? Do not do synthetic division to try to figure it out. Nope, nope, nope. What you want to do is you want to plug in one into your function, this being the function that we're going to use, okay? So you want to plug in one into that function, negative one. You want to plug in three, negative three, um, five, negative five, 15, so on and so forth, okay? I'm not going to go very far. And you just need to find one. Why do I just need to find one? Because this is a cube. As soon as I take one of the factors out, I'm done. I'm down to an x squared. And I know how to do the quadratic formula for that. So let's go see which one of these work. So let me store one stores x. And then I'm going to type x to the third minus 2x squared minus 75. And I get negative 76. So that ain't it. Let me do the next value and then plug it in. I get negative 78, so that ain't it. Oops. Three stores X. Let's go plug in three. We get negative 66, so that ain't it. 
let's store neg or try negative three. Oh no. Let's try five. Ah, I get zero. Okay. And so since I got zero or five, five is the number that I'm going to do my synthetic division for. Okay. Now I'm not going to do that for all of them. Okay. And so it's saying that notice that there's no sign changes. It, well, there is, there is one sign change. So there's got to have one of these positive ones to work. Um, I don't care. I don't go to try only try the positives or only try the negatives. I just do them all and it's just typing it in the calculator. It's not that big of a deal. So anyway, bring down the one, multiply by five, combine, multiply, combine, multiply, combine, and you get your remainder of zero. This is your A, your B, and your C for your quadratic formula. Um, it doesn't look like they did quadratic formula. Oh yeah, they did. Um, so you do X equals negative B plus or minus B squared minus four times A times C all over two times A. And so you get negative three plus or minus nine plus four times 15. So nine minus 60 is negative 51. And so automatically you know that these are imaginary, right? So these are not real. And you're talking about a real life situation. So that means that the only solution only real solution is x equal to five, which was the one that you, the first one that you found, okay? Um, and so then that has to be the correct solution. But I think it asked you for the height. In order for you to find the height, that's x minus two, which means five minus two, which means the height is three inches. Um, so let's go ahead and do some practice problems and see how these are going to look in your homework, okay? So it says, for number one, determine the number of zeros the polynomial function has. Well, first, this is not in the right order. The higher exponent needs to be in the front, and then the smaller exponent needs to be in the back. And then you always just look at the highest exponent to determine how many zeros it's going to have. It's going to have seven zeros. Now, whether they be real or imaginary, we don't know. Um, this one says, use the rational zero test just to list the possible zeros, okay? So we're gonna find the factors of the constant, which is 16, over the factors of the leading coefficient, which is one. So that means one times 16, I do it like this, and then I just list them. So one times 16, two times eight, three doesn't go, four times four. So I get one, two, four. I don't need to repeat four. And then eight and 16. And the factors of one are one. And so then one over one is one, two over one is two, four over one is four. And I'm just making sure I include all the sign variations. So then I have one, two, three, four, there's 10 possibilities here. And if they don't list them like this, you might see them listed like this. Okay, there's all 10. That didn't ask me to find them, it just asked me to list them. Okay. Now this one says find, if possible, the rational zeros of this function. So I don't know where to start. I am going to do my possible zeros. So I'm going to do the factors of my constant, which is 30, over the factors of my coefficient, which is 1, this guy. So then that is, let's see, 30. 1 times 30, 2 times 15, 3 times 10, 4, no, 5 times 6, and 6 is already here. So it's one, two, three, five, six, ten, 
15 and 30 over one. So that means I'm gonna have all the sign variations of one over one, two over one, three over one, five over one, six over one, 10 over one, 15 over one, and 30, okay? Um, and then I gotta find the ones that actually work. Now this is a cube. So I only need to find one in order for me to get to the quadratic formula. So I'm gonna do f of one, f of negative one, f of two, f of negative two, f of three, f of negative three. I don't know how many of them I have to do. Hopefully not all, all of them, but let's program. One store x, and then I'm gonna plug in this function. x to the third minus 31x plus 30. Oh, I got lucky. I got zero right away. Well, that's perfect. So then I'm going to do my, my synthetic division, but I'm going to use one. And so I have one. I do not have any x squared. I have negative 31x, and I have a 30 co a constant. So start the process. One. I get one. Multiply, I get one. Negative 30. Uh, multiply, I get negative 30, and I get that zero like I was supposed to get, right? This is the remainder, and that's the remainder I got. There's my A, my B, and my C. So X equals negative B plus or minus B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. That's going to be 121 over 2 which is 11 over two. So I get negative one plus 11 over two and negative one minus 11 over two. That is 10 over two and negative 12 over two, which is the same thing as five and negative six. And so it said, find the rational zeros of the function. Here are the zeros. The first one, was the one I found over there. And then the other two are from the quadratic formula. And so these are the zeros. Okay, now another problem that we'll have is it says find the polynomial um, with real coefficients that have the given zeros and you have these, okay? Now we already know that if we have negative 2i, we're also going to have its conjugate, which is positive 2i, okay? And so if we want the function, the function is going to be f of x equals a, x minus one zero, x minus another zero, and x minus the last zero. Now remember, if it just says find a polynomial, you do make the a equal to one. And that's plus 2i and then x minus 2i. And so then if I want to figure this out, I'm going to distribute my 1. Here, I'm going to foil these out. So x times x is x squared, negative 2xi, positive 2xi, and then negative 4i squared. So these will cancel. And then this will turn this to a plus. So it'll be plus 4. And then I can boil that out. So x cubed plus 4x minus 2x squared minus 8. And if I write it in descending order, it'll be x cubed minus 2x squared plus 4x minus 8. And this is the polynomial that they're looking for. OK. This one's almost the exact same thing, okay? It says it's degree four, so I should have four zeros. They only give me three, but we know since this one is i, that we automatically have its conjugate negative i, okay? They also gave me this. So they're basically telling me when x equals zero, the y equals negative six, okay? That's important. That's gonna help us figure out what a is because I can't write, I'm not finding a polynomial, I'm finding the polynomial. 
which means I have to use this extra bit of information to find the correct A, okay? So I'm gonna start off with the, with the template. I don't know what A is right now, but X minus the first zero, X minus the second zero, X minus the third zero, and X minus the implied fourth zero. I can write this as X plus two, X minus one, X minus I, and X plus I. And I can do all of this part, I just can't do the A just yet, okay? So I am gonna simplify all of this. I'm gonna go ahead and multiply those two and then multiply those two. So I get X squared minus X plus two X minus two. Here I get X squared plus X I minus X I minus I squared. I get X squared plus X minus two. And here these cancel and this is a negative negative one. So it's X squared plus one. And then keep going, we're almost there. We're gonna have X to the fourth plus X squared plus X cubed plus X minus two X squared minus two. So I get X to the fourth plus X cubed minus X squared plus X minus two. Just combining my like terms, these guys. Okay, now I'm gonna use this point. So the Y value, remember this is fancy way of saying Y. So the Y value is gonna become negative six and the X value will become zero. And so in the parentheses, I just get zero plus zero minus zero plus zero minus two, which is negative two. And then to solve for A, I'll have to divide by negative two. So then I get A equals to positive three. So then now I can tell them the function. It's gonna be three times X to the fourth plus X cubed minus X squared plus X minus two. Or if I distribute that three, I get three X to the fourth plus three X cubed minus three X squared plus three X minus six. And this is the function that has these three zeros and this as an extra solution point, okay? Now here's the last problem, like a problem you'll see in, in the assignment. It says use the given zero to find all the zeros of the function. So you have one and it's imaginary. So that means you automatically have its conjugate negative four plus five i. The only part that changes sign is the imaginary part whenever you're doing the conjugate. It's only the imaginary part that changes sign. So remember I did this problem in a different way than they did and I'm gonna do it again my same way. So I'm gonna do the synthetic division since I already know that negative four plus five I is a zero. There's gonna be a lot of side work. I'm gonna go do it up here at the top, okay? Now highest exponent is three. So the coefficient of X three, the coefficient of X two, the coefficient of X one and the coefficient or the constant. And I should get zero since it's saying it's a quote unquote zero, right? Now let's see, one times negative four is negative four, one times five i is five i. I can combine the real parts, I get seven plus five i. Now up top, I'm gonna do seven plus five i times this guy here, negative four plus five i. So that's negative 28, that's positive 35 i, that's negative 20i, and that's positive 25i squared. So this will turn this to a negative, okay? Um, and so then I get negative 28 minus 25, which is negative 53, and then positive 35 minus 20 is positive 15i. 
So I'm gonna write that underneath here. And again, I can combine the real parts. I will get 12 plus 15i. And then supposedly 12 plus 15i times negative four plus five i should give me negative 123 so that these can go to zero. You don't need to do it, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it just to verify. So I get negative 48, I get positive 60i, oops, I get negative 60i, and then what is 15 times five? I get, mm, positive 75 i squared. So this is gonna turn this to negative. These are gonna cancel. Negative 48 minus 75 is negative 123, which is exactly what I thought it was gonna be, okay? So that was the hard one, okay? Now we're gonna do it again, but we're gonna do it again with the other um, zero. So negative four minus five i. And if you remember from that example, this one's a whole lot easier, okay? We do know that the last one should be zero because it is technically a zero, right? So we're gonna bring down this negative or just one, bring down one. And then one times this is negative four, one times this is positive five i. Oh no, it's negative five i. So then here you get three, and then here the imaginaries part cancel. Three times negative four is negative 12. Three times negative five is i is negative 15 i, which is exactly why we get zero, okay? Now remember, this is your constant and this is your x. So you have in your factorization, you have x minus this zero. You have x minus this zero. And you have one x and a positive three. If I clean this up, this is x minus four plus five i, x plus four or plus four, and then minus five i, and then x plus three. And so what are the zeros? The zeros are the one they gave us the one we automatically knew we had. And then if you set this equal to zero, you get negative three as the third zero, okay? And so there are only three zeros and we have found all of them. And that is the end of this section. It's quite a bit. So please do make sure that you go into WebAssign and you practice these problems.